example if you wish. Um, we try not only to be signatories to the various UN conventions out there and other conventions, a special envoy on issues on interreligious and intercultural affairs, uh, and obviously one on uh, human rights specifically. And what does it give us? Um, we can work with is soft power. We're not a big country. We are not um, bigger than uh, the sort of the attention that we can bring to ourselves and to the issues we're surrounded by by um, uh, of people, of structures, of governments, of of um, all sort of sectors that are a bit closer in their mindset, in their values, um, uh, to us than we would be otherwise. And it gives fundamentally, and I come back to, to my initial point, it gives us a world uh, with more, stronger um, socioeconomic stability, which we all benefit from. I think I close there. Thank you. And I think we all need to to further this because 50 women is, is a very small group of women. Uh, so now let me introduce to you um, London University School of Economics and a master's MPhil and PhD from Columbia University in New York. Her PhD thesis was on concepts of hegemony and international regimes, a case study on the international trade and non-proliferation regimes. Dr. Mazari has served as Director General, Institute of Strategic Studies, Islamabad, and Chinese Qaeda Azam University. Dr. Mazari is a regular columnist and was editor of the Nation newspaper. She, has, she was also DG, CEO of the Strategic Studies Institute in Islamabad, which is a private research center from which she resigned before joining and becoming Federal Minister for Human Rights, Shireen Mazari. Thank you. Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim The introduction clearly saw me less as a specialist on human rights and more of a specialist on defense-related issues, but the challenge has been greater. Panelists, ladies and gentlemen, <coughs> human rights diplomacy. We are uh, people are focusing on it. Some talk about human rights and foreign policy. Others talk on different aspects of human rights. What I want to really talk about is human rights diplomacy. Because diplomacy in the traditional sense, just like war in the traditional sense, really ended with the evolution of hybrid warfare. In the same way, traditional diplomacy where interstate relations were conducted through strict diplomatic traditions governed by the Vienna Conventions and for, uh, relating to traditional spheres of concern, which for diplomats were seen as interstate relations, discussing trade, discussing consular interaction, a few conferences here and there um, in times of war trying to bring about negotiations but nothing beyond that. Um, basic rights of people were not part of diplomacy. And it's very interesting, um, if you really want to know what diplomacy was, you should read Lawrence Durrell's three books on the conduct of uh, how Britain conducted its diplomacy. They're hilarious, those books. There's a book called Esprit de Corps, there's a book called Stiff Upper Lip, and so on. And then you get an idea of what traditional diplomats, with due respect to all the diplomats sitting here and on the stage, this is what real diplomats did. And as you know, Pakistan inherited the British legacy uh, through colonialism. So our bureaucracy, including that, I'm not talking just of the Foreign Office, but our bureaucracy generally, including that of the Foreign Office, still continues to reflect the old British tradition of bureaucrats. Um, and in the Foreign Office, of course, there's this whole notion of esprit de corps, 
and you outsiders are not welcome in the hallowed halls of the foreign office and of course what do diplomats do well of course they learn languages they learn the world history at least we hope they do because we have entrants who have no background on social sciences and of course they must learn etiquette how to use forks knives and spoons and their spouses are also tra um, trained in that although i've always wondered why should they learn how to use knives forks and spoons our tradition is to eat with the hand so maybe we should treat, teach them to spread that message it's apparently much more hygienic in any case anyhow my point is simply that this is what traditional diplomacy was all about and i'm not denying that there is an advantage to that but we have to realize that the world has moved on that this is the age of specialists um the, these are times when international conventions international treaties have actually eroded this concept of what was known as the anarchic world order that every state is there's anarchy because there's no world government there are no global rules and so on well the fact is that there are countries have voluntarily eroded piecemeal their sovereignty by becoming parties to international conventions international treaties and in some issue areas actually creating a whole lot of regimes so when we have that then we realize that interstate relations have altered it's not a question of one foreign office talking to another foreign office it's not a question of even one government talking to another government look at the uh, economic sphere you have the private sector you have multinationals states don't really have full control over their economies not even the most developed states and of course in terms of diplomacy this these are times now where international law for example is required to assess how to move forward advantageously in a world strewn with treaties and convention commitments unfortunately the mandarins of the sherazad hotel and i must clarify i made this reference earlier a lot of young people don't know what the sherazad hotel is that is where the foreign office is established it used to be a very nice five star hotel was grabbed by the then government i won't name which was not the pti government and that's where the foreign office was established so the mandarins of the sherazad hotel have not kept pace i sadly have to say with these changes and one basic reflection of this was the major blunder that was made in 2018 when the icj was hearing the yadev case and it suddenly discovered that uh, when we were pleading and saying we have a 2008 bilateral uh, consular access agreement with india and the icj said what agreement we don't recognize it because you fail to register it with the un all bilateral agreements to be recognized by un organizations have to be registered so 2008 agreement was signed between pakistan and india and the mandarins of the sherazad hotel simply forgot or because there's no proper international law division failed to register that agreement doing untold damage to pakistan uh, in terms of our cause in the icj to date there is sadly no international law expertise present in mofa at all and there is also with due apologies again to azaz and many of other ex diplomats there is like in all bureaucracies uh, and especially the bureaucratic systems here yeah, there is a hide bound refusal to realize the changing nature of how states interstate relations especially how diplomacy should now be conducted pakistan has opted to become party to a plethora of human rights conventions 
There's the ICCPR, there is the ICESCR, the cultural and economic rights, the political rights. Then there's the Convention Against Terrorism. There is CEDO on women. There is the Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities. There is the, IC, uh, the, the uh, Convention on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. We're parties to all these conventions. And we have accepted also special agreements uh, with uh, uh, organizations like the European Union, where we have made commitments in, uh, in, lieu or in exchange for getting uh, concessions on trade, we have made commitments that we will fulfill our obligations that we have voluntarily undertaken when we signed these seven human rights conventions, apart from a number of other conventions also, like the labor conventions and uh, climate change and so on. So it is a commit these are commitments that Pakistan has made. In other words, what I'm trying to say is that what is not being realized in traditional diplomatic no, uh, conduct in Pakistan although lip service is paid to the concept of human rights, is the centrality now of human rights diplomacy in international relations. The world has changed, and we are still not adapting to that change. And this is one of the reasons why we have failed to take advantage of multiple options relating to human rights to expose Indian fascist designs in occupied Jammu and Kashmir, and I'll come to that later. So, um, Azhar Saab uh, asked the question, what is human rights diplomacy? Well, one way to define it is that it is negotiating, bargaining, and advocating processes associated with the promotion and protection of international and national human rights. And then the first question that is raised is, how to conduct such diplomacy in the most effective way? Because on the one hand, you have to balance considerations relating to respect for international human rights law, to which we have become party on so many fronts. And on the other hand, we have to also maintain friendly relations between states. So sometimes adopting a behind the scenes approach to resolve human rights issues becomes very useful. So then how we carry out human rights diplomacy determines to a large degree the success of our interventions. And you need to take in many factors into consideration. One is, what are the human rights you're talking about? If the, as Asab talked about the blasphemy issue, this is a sensitive issue. A lot more should be done behind the scenes. And that is how uh, the, uh, 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 you know, Asia Bibi finally traveled abroad. Things were done behind the scenes, which allowed uh, uh, developments to take place. Um, there is also, of course, um, the issue of which state are you going to be dealing with. Um, if a state has a record of non-action or non-responsiveness to human rights abuses, sometimes you may need to call out and shame, name and shame them. That has an impact. But then you have to balance that with if you do it to, or you go too far, the state may get on the defensive. We are seeing that with Myanmar and the Nobel um, lady who has denied so far any abuse of the Rohingyas. And the more the criticism has come, the more defensive she has become. And now she's gone to the ICJ to present and apparently clear the name of her government from any human rights abuses. So that is also another issue that we have to deal with. Then, of course, and most crucial is a state's own institutional capacity. Every state has different economic, political, strategic, and other concerns on the basis of which we shape our internal and external policies. And the institutional capacity of each state will differ. And as, as I pointed out earlier, our institutional capacity at the Foreign Office vis-a-vis -vis international law sadly, is not what it should be. Anyhow, there is also questions, okay, this is what the state should do. What about us as individuals? How do we determine whether public advocacy 
is required or some other approach is required. And therefore, all these factors have to really come into being before we are able to formulate a comprehensive human rights diplomacy, which will further the interests of the country as well as uh, project the country as a firm defender and supporter of human rights and living up to the commitments that a country has made through international treaties and conventions. And I also want to point out that human rights actors are not just now state institutions. We have corporations, particularly multinational, we have civil society, and of course, especially in the business field, because now uh, so many conditionalities govern international trade, especially in terms of child labor, la other labor rights. So the business community has to be involved more and more in what is now becoming a very important uh, field in human rights, and that's business and human rights. And it's one of the issues that was, is being discussed at the Human Rights um, Council in Geneva. Our ministry participated in the recently held session there. And we are also, of course, drafting uh, procedures uh, and trying to get all the stakeholders on board for finally evolving an action plan on business and human rights because the business sector is very important. So coming back then to issues that concern Pakistan. One is the GSP plus uh, and the focus by the EU on human rights commitments made under the seven conventions that I already mentioned. Um, what we have achieved on these conventions is tremendous. We have moved forward on a number of issues, whether it is uh, examining laws uh, and punishments relating to the death penalty. We are trying to narrow down the scope of crimes that come under the death penalty because some are from British times and are really redundant. We have streamlined, as uh, Rabia pointed out, the mercy petition procedure. We have uh, moved ahead on a number of fields, uh, including, of course, our commitments on protection of children. We have laws there. We have uh, the Juvenile Justice Act. Uh, we have the Transgender Act, one of the most progressive in the world. I think there are very few countries that have trans, uh, transgender laws. So we have moved forward on all the seven human rights conventions. Sadly, the projection in traditional diplomatic norm, uh, diplomacy is not being done um, as it should be done. I think the need to expand and co-opt all the stakeholders to be able to project the cause better, especially now that there's a new European Parliament which has a very different make from the previous European Parliament. We need to be able to, it, it's not enough for the Foreign Office to do it because they don't know enough because they don't know what is happening in the human rights field. If there is a need to co-opt and involve the other stakeholders, the Commerce Ministry, the Human Rights Ministry, because these are the people who are actually dealing with the issues that are part of the GSP+. Now let me come to Kashmir. Much was, we heard much about the Swedish foreign policy, its feminist nature, focus on human rights. The Scandinavian countries led the world and got accepted this principle of R2P, responsibility to protect. Sadly, it has still not been operationalized. In the, uh, it is done in a discriminatory way, selective way. And that is why I want to come to Kashmir. Why, is, why are all those states in the West who propagate and support R2P not using this principle to intervene and uh, stop the human rights abuses by the Indian occupation forces in occupied Jammu and Kashmir. We um, also, uh, the Prime Minister of Pakistan laid a very categorical and clear-cut narrative on Kashmir and exposed India's uh, fascism 
It showed what Modi was doing was very similar to what happened in Europe during Nazi times. And because there was the Munich and appeasement, we saw what finally happened. And we are seeing the same thing, annexation of an occupied territory. Uh, we are seeing uh, a policy of Liebenstrom that the Nazis used. Now we have the Akhund Bharat that the Indian government is using. And yet, there is a strange, uncomfortable silence from those who talk about supporting human rights and the R2P principle. Um, we feel also that our traditional diplomats have failed to project, despite the Prime Minister's uh, groundbreaking narrative on Kashmir, it has not been followed up effectively by our traditional diplomats. Um, the Human Rights Ministry did try to move on this because, you see, if you do not look at the expansive nature of human rights now, you will not be able to fight your cause effectively. So we, for example, I wrote a letter to the human High Commissioner for Human Rights in Geneva on 5th of August, protesting about the use of cluster bombs by the Indian Armed Forces across the line of control, because this is contrary to international humanitarian law, especially since Pakistan and India are both parties to the, uh, what is known in popular language as the Inhumane Weapons Convention. Uh, but it was never followed up after that. Um, I don't know what was happening in Geneva in our mission. On the 23rd of August, from on my ministry's behalf, I sent a letter to 18 human rights special procedures mandate holders. And they, these hold the mandate on different human rights aspects, on women, on children, and so on pointing out the human rights abuses being taken that are taking place by the Indian occupation forces in occupied Jammu and Kashmir. Nothing much followed up. 19 September, I wrote a letter to UN OCHA, the United Nations Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs in New York, asking that a humanitarian corridor be accepted, uh, be created to supply humanitarian aid and assistance to occupy, into occupied Kashmir, given that the siege and lockdown was going on and massive abuses of human rights were taking place. Women couldn't go to hospitals, um, there were children couldn't get to schools, food was in short supply. And humanitarian corridors have been formed in many conflict zones. So we've, uh, I felt that uh, on behalf of our ministry requested UN OCHA to move ahead on that. Uh, sadly, uh, our previous uh, envoy to the UN uh, uh, was unable to take up this issue. I'm hoping that the new envoy will. What I'm trying to say is that there are areas where we can make our case other than traditional state-to-state -state diplomacy, other than just going to the UN General Assembly or the UN Security Council. There are forums where if we make human rights diplomacy an integral part of our foreign policy, we will be able to have more impact and get more responses than we are doing now. And one of the areas that for years I've been saying we have neglected is on women. The UN Security Council passed Resolution 1325 on women, peace, and security. Rape has been used as a weapon of war. The cases of Pushpora and Konan, where the Indian security forces went in, separated the children and the men, and did a mass rape of women, is recorded in Indian uh, court uh, in Indian courts, it has been. It's not something I am concocting up of Pakistan. Is it's a fact that this happened, and yet, how many times have our diplomats raised this on the use of rape as a weapon of war and the culture of impunity? I was at this um, Global Women Leaders Conference in um, Iceland about a couple of weeks ago, where the women, peace, and security was an issue. And the ex-president of Kosovo was there. And the two of us raised this and said it should be put into the declaration that rape as a weapon of war cannot be condoned. And this culture of impunity of not punishing the security forces that do this 
has to also be removed. Um, this was a forum that effectively we have more or less neglected. I happened to go there. And um, I think, sadly, if we had greater competency and awareness of international law, of all these other bodies that exist, and if we would substantively make human rights diplomacy an integral part of our foreign policy, I think there would be a multiplier effect on how, uh, especially on the Kashmir cause, which is, of course, very close to Pakistan. Also, again, I think we could have easily asked for a United Nations General Assembly resolution. It goes by vote, so even if you have one vote in your, more vote in your favor, that's a majority. For an advisory opinion from the ICJ on the annexation of uh, uh, occupied Jammu and Kashmir by India. I say that because the ICJ has already given advisory opinions on change of status of occupied territories and that is the I ICJ judgment on the wall that was built by Israel in the occupied Palestinian territories and this is regarded as a war crime. You cannot change the demography which the Indians are trying to do, and you cannot change the status of an occupied territory. And of course, uh, this is something we should have, and we still can, and we should push for. So what I am trying to say is that human rights should be taken as something that not only should we project and uh, push for within our own country, but it is a tool where we can, which we can use diplomatically to rectify or expose at least the injustices being done to, uh, in areas like occupied Kashmir by Indian uh, security forces. So what we need to do basically then is to have a thematic human rights approach to diplomacy. Not just say, okay, this country is doing X, Y, Z violations. That's fine. But overall, first, we should have a thematic approach to human rights diplomacy uh, as opposed to just a country-specific approach. Because if we develop a thematic approach to human rights diplomacy, we become a step closer to overcoming selective human rights diplomacy or what I would term human rights hypocrisy, which prevails in so many parts of the world. What I mean is, when I say thematic uh, human rights diplomacy, that states should develop policies on specific human rights areas, women, children, refugees, differently able, religious minorities, have an overall policy on all these issues. Then, when abuse happens, in different countries, including what India is doing in occupied Kashmir, we have the background and we have the credibility to take up those issues. And the same goes to countries in Europe, Australia, the developed world, where despite lip service being paid to human rights, the approach is still country specific and selective. And that is why we are not seeing operationalization of the responsibility to protect which was with much fanfare uh, pushed and accepted by the international community. But those who propagated it clearly have not really lived up to their commitments to this pr principle. So thematic perspective on human rights diplomacy is what is needed. And that will, in practice, strengthen international human rights standards and even push for the rec recognition of more co comprehensive standards of protection. The world has changed. We need to change with it. We really have to alter our mindsets and remove the sort of structural uh, barriers uh, which continue to haunt and reign supreme in the corridors of places like the Shahrazad Hotel, now the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So, all the conventions that Shirin was mentioning, 
I am not familiar with them, is that foreign policies of nations uh, can be driven by more than one imperative. Whether morality has any place in the formulation of national strategies, particularly in, in, in terms of its foreign policy. Towards the larger question of, do you believe that morality is of the factors that you use for decision making, or perhaps even be the decisive factor in de developing your national strategies. What we have seen uh, in terms of the approach of the current prime minister, he's been the prime minister for a year or so now, just over a year. You would have seen it in the decisions he has taken uh, as they affect foreign policy and general running of the state. But more so, uh, I would say that Chiri and I have seen over the years of him as a political leader, of him as a person, that he strongly believes that you must begin analyzing a situation or formulating a decision by first trying to come to the conclusion as what is the right thing to do, i.e. what is the moral thing to do. I strongly uh, endorse that point of view. I realize the difficulty in implementing this principle because you can very easily move away from what is considered to be fundamentally right and what is considered to be a universal human right to what are cultural factors. And, and we've seen uh, a fair bit of that happening also. Uh, but regardless of what we agree on as universal human rights, and of course there are international conventions which codify that, but even at a personal level, uh, I don't think anybody can disagree that there are some rights which go above national boundaries, which go above the right of sovereignty and legislation, and which are universal in, in nature, and therefore should get universal sanction uh, and universal support. And that is why I believe that in the formulation of our diplomatic strategy, human rights should be a, a central pillar because that's the view of the state that we have uh, for Pakistan itself. There are two different aspects of it, of course. It is how do we pro propagate our uh, views in terms of human rights as they impact uh, events happening around the world. And of course, we are more greatly influenced by events happening in our uh, neighborhood, but not just restricted to that. Uh, there, is the, there is the larger humanity that we are a part of. Uh, we do have a Muslim identity that we are very proud of. So obviously uh, events which impact Muslims around the world resonate more strongly with us. They, they, we have, they're felt uh, at a more personal level. Uh, but that does not mean that the rest of humanity is of no interest to us and we should stand up for the rights of, of all human beings, not just those who are Muslims. Uh, it just so happens, in my opinion, uh, I could be wrong, uh, it could be my bias coming through, but it just so happens that the two most egregious violations of human rights, uh, which have spanned more than seven decades now, uh, happen to be Palestine and Kashmir. Uh, it could be me as a Muslim speaking, maybe this is my bias, uh, but that's also my at least attempt at being unbiased has still arrived at the same conclusion. So there is that aspect of it, and of course in the diplomacy that we conduct, we have uh, spoken on the human rights angle, and uh, if you have seen the approach that the Prime Minister and this current government has taken over the last 15 years to the Kashmir issue, yes, it, is, uh, it has legal ramification, yes, water rights are a very, very important an integral part of the Kashmir issue, and there are other ramifications, but above all, it's a human issue, and that's the way we have approached it, and that's the way the Prime Minister has articulated his message, as, as, well, as, the, uh, as well as the Foreign Minister and the, and the diplomats uh, that we have around the world propagated it. But there is the other aspect of it, which is human rights as it applies to what we are doing here in Pakistan. And I think 
while we have not just every right, but it is our obligation as human beings, and it is our moral duty to talk about the causes that I mentioned, like uh, Kashmir and Palestine. Uh, it is also our moral duty to make sure that we stand up for the same human rights within Pakistan as well. And, uh, and I'm proud that we have a human rights minister who speaks up on these issues. Uh, and there is, if you, if you see what she says uh, in the public domain, after becoming the human rights minister, and uh, her positions on these issues have been a matter of public record, if you see what she used to say before she was a minister of the government and before she had the responsibility for human rights, you would not see any deviation in those. So she's standing by the principles that she believes in. And that's generally the approach that the government has taken overall as well. Are we perfect? No, we are not. Uh, is Pakistan a perfect place for all citizens and do all the uh, weaker segments of society, the religious minorities, women, etc., uh, uh, do they have the ability to live a life uh, that they should, not even close to it. So those gaps, those gaps are visible, those are acknowledged, and that's a process that is a continuous struggle and we'll continue to be uh, participants in that struggle, trying to close that gap, uh, but at least there is a recognition that this is our commitment, that's what our constitution uh, ob obliges us to do. We believe, most of us believe, that's what our religion obliges us to do. And, and I can go on and give you umpteen examples from the lives of the, of the Prophet uh, ﷺ, uh, of uh, amazing advocacy and practice of human rights, the like of which is difficult to see even in the 21st century today. Uh, so that's, that's the guiding uh, principle that we have received uh, in our homes, in our schools, uh, from the Parliament of Pakistan. So, uh, so therefore, I think uh, it, it is without any degree of uh, ambiguity or, uh, or any sense of uh, perhaps being uh, on the defensive that we should, we do, and we should even more increasingly, some of the technical aspects that Shirin was pointing out, perhaps that we have not been able to use the, the four eyes, international four eyes effectively as we should, but certainly that is something that we should continue to strive for because that's what we genuinely believe in. Uh, so with that, I will, uh, I will uh, thank the, uh, uh, the Human Rights Minister for inviting me here, despite being, as I said, singularly ill-suited for the purpose. And, uh, and thank you very much, all of you, for taking out the time in being here today. in another place, especially the powerful. Yeah. And um, I, I guess you put the question to my colleague uh, on Diego Garcia, but I just want to comment because I've been reading up on the Diego Garcia claim, 
And it's unfortunate that the international community is not moving on it because you do have a very strong claim historically and legally to those islands. But who will tell Mr. Trump to give you back the island? <laughs> or the British? <laughs> okay. Uh, any other questions? Uh, there was a gentleman. Yes, Chief. Bilkul. Kawaneen ki implementation ni ho rhi. Aur usme kai human rights ke kawaneen bhi hai. So our ministry is now moving to implement uh, those laws. The second aspect hai ki jidhar kui kanoon ki kami hai, udhar hum nai kanoon bana, bana, hum legislation kar rahe hai. Humare bills human rights ke abhi Standing Committee mein koi saat aat mahine se phase mein hai. Human Rights Standing Committee mein Zainab Alert bill humara Persons with Disabilities bill phasa hai udhar. Koi chhe bill humare Law Ministry mein is vat hai. Jis mein Senior Citizens ka bill hai. Jis mein Domestic Violence ka bill hai. Torture wala bill hai. To humare paas ho saare kar rahe hai. Tisra hum kar rahe hai Awareness Programs کہ لوگوں کو پتا چلے ان کے حقوق ہیں کیا کئی خاص طور پر جو ہمارے رورل ایریاز ہیں جو دور دراز کے علاقے ہیں ان کو ادھر پتا ہی نہیں لوگوں کو what their rights are so awareness programs بہت لازمی ہیں ہم نے عورتوں کے inheritance کے اوپر awareness program کیا ہے جس سے ہم نے cooperate کیا ہے council of islamic ideology کے ساتھ child abuse پر ہمارا ongoing program ہے اسلامباد میں میں خود جاتی ہوں سکولز میں جیسے پیرنٹ سے ملتی ہوں ہم نے اب بارہ کمیونٹی گروپس بنائے ہیں اسلامباد میں جیسے ہم نے لوکل لوگوں کو اور جو لوکل خطیب ہیں لوکل بزنس مین ٹریڈرز ہیں سیول سوسائیٹی ہے ہر علاقے کی ان کا ایک گروپ بنایا ہے اور یہ اینی یومن رائٹس ابیوز کمپلینٹ از انٹرٹینٹ اور ہمارے ہیلپ لائن میں لائرز بھی ہیں specialists and then they take up the issue and you know that in the Prime Minister's office there are also citizens portal complaints and there is a new app that comes from our children it's called our children in which kidnapping and child complaints are directly PM office through foreign concerned authority will come to them so these are three approaches جو کہ ہماری منسٹری اور پرائم منسٹر آفیس اور احساس پروگرام یہ سارے کوشش کر رہے ہیں کہ جدر جدر کمی ہے وہ پوری ہو and we are able to implement a human rights agenda fully in Pakistan as we are committed to doing اور جو ہماری duty ہے according not only to our constitution but ہمارے اپنی جو religious ہمارے مذہب کے مطابق بھی ہے کہ ہم نے یہ انسانی حقوق کو آگے لے کے چلنا ہے تو یہ طریقہ کار ہے جو ہماری منسٹری کر رہی ہے تینکیو بری مچ اب جسٹ سب کو آپ کو شکریہ دا کرتی ہوں اور پلیز آپ لنچ پہ آگے آئیے گا تینکیو ایوری بری فیر پاکس پہ